Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Man, what a great day to be in the house of Yahweh. Well, I know all of you read your Torah portion and your well, well versed. This is old, old stuff, right? But now you keep plowing the same field and new stuff every day. It's inter interesting how it works like that, isn't it? You read these things and you're going to, what? Somebody has been in my Bible messing around with it. All right. <clears throat> I'll start with a little trivia. This is kind of interesting. Adar. The, you know, we're still in the month of Adar, even though March started a couple of days ago. But just see how man's calendar is so off. So, <clears throat> actually, in, in Judaism, Adar is considered a, a month of joy because of Purim happens in this month. And how that uh, God used Esther and so forth to save his people. So, <clears throat> but anyway, the, I think the main thing is to looking forward to the time of redemption. And uh, it's interesting that in this month that uh, Moses was born and he died. And if you, I don't know if you've ever really read that or dawned on you that he died on the day he was born. So, 120 years later to the day. So, it's kind of interesting. The uh, <clears throat> rabbis set that date as 2368 B.C., Adar 7. So, it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> I think they're probably pretty close because we see when we read in the first, last part of Deuteronomy when uh, Moses does pass away, they're taken up into the mountain and... <clears throat> and uh, died is that uh, they had 40 days of mourning for him and then there right there after Joshua took the, the children of Israel into the land and uh, he told them you know three days we're going to cross over Jordan to wash your clothes and to, to be ready in three days we're going to cross over into into the promised land across the Jordan and then when they got there they circumcised all the male and then three days later, basically, they had the Passover. So it's just kind of interesting to, to look at. Do what? Yeah. So <clears throat> and, uh, we're going to, uh, to read about, or in this Torah portion, is actually about, you know, Mount Sinai, the, uh, where that the uh, children of Israel wound up and that uh, the last couple of tour portions has been about that but this is the one that uh, we get the big ten that are written and we're going to look at a couple of interesting things there as we go through so we just pray to the father that uh, he give us a enlightenment the understanding of your word father that uh, you will the words that are spoken will be to your name's honor and glory and that uh, we will Receive a blessing by being here and being in your house, Father. We just thank for all things uphold those that are unable to be with us. These things we ask in Yeshua's name as we go forward into Kitsa. That's the name of our Torah portion. And I ran across this picture and I thought it was really, really cool. The uh, <clears throat> Ten Commandments coming, setting on the mountaintop. And uh, of course, Kitsa means when you take. And uh, basically what he's talking about is when you take a census. But we're going to uh, see something there that uh, hadn't really uh, made a correlation between before I was reading and studying this. We're going to read Exodus 30, 11. <clears throat> and Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, When thou take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto Jehovah. When thou numberst them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberst them. Interesting. You know, we've had a couple of deals about numbering when you 
start numbering and, and you often wonder, well, what's the problem? Why, what's so abominable about numbering the people? Well, <clears throat> the thing that I think about is, is lack of faith maybe. Because when we start numbering, we're depending on the number instead of on the Father. That he's going to provide, protect, all these different types of things. And uh, <clears throat> it's kind of like, you know, when you go into war, you number, well, we've got 100,000 troops that we're going to send in there, you know. Strength, might, it's going to be our might, you know. And there's several stories in the scriptures that, that shows that uh, it's not by power or our might, but by his spirit, right? And that, uh, <clears throat> so that's, I think that's really what he's trying to say here. It says, uh, <clears throat> so we're going to move to the next one. Everyone that passes among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto Jehovah. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto Jehovah to make an atonement for their soul. Interesting how these words are connected to offerings, how they're connected to actually money. And they shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before Jehovah to make an atonement for your souls. Interesting. I know this is, <clears throat> this is a law, basically, of law of Moses contained within and it's uh, it's basically even practiced in Judaism today and I've seen it practices in Messianic Judaism this idea of a redemption of paying a redemptive price to uh, a priest basically even a, a Levit Levitical priest for redemption and it always seemed kind of strange to me you know that uh, God would require money so it's interesting that I was when I was reading and, and studying this and thinking about it I said well you know does that is that something that applies to us today is that something that we need to be worried about or doing or thinking about and then <clears throat> read this verse in first Peter <clears throat> I'm sorry, did I miss one? I read that one, right? All right. It says first Peter one eighteen twenty two, for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Yeshua, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in Yehovah that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in Yehovah. Seeing you have purified your soul in obeying the truth, through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Wow. I know we talked about, you know, love your neighbor as yourself and these types of things, and it's it's been there from the very, very beginning. But I just thought, you know, how privileged we are to be living in a time when redemption is paid by Yeshua redemption has been paid and not by corruptible things as silver and gold it says received by tradition from your fathers Psalms 111.9 he sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. Of course, this was David talking 
a long time before the Messiah came, yet says he sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. So we know that that, that covenant is from the very beginning. Beginning of time here on this earth, there was a covenant made. The fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom. We talked about the word fear there, being respect. But also, to a certain extent, loving fear. Is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All of his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. They stand forever and ever. As we see in this Torah portion, you know, that the Ten Commandments are written upon stone and given to man. Something that is durable. Go back to Exodus 31. It says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe the Shabbat throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Perpetual covenant. Perpetual, something that's perpetual is ongoing all the time and, and <clears throat> forever. It said, Is it a sign between me and the children of Israel forever? For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of Elohim. Two tables of testimony. You know, that's what it talks about. It says, uh, those that, that keeps the commandments and has the testimony of Yahshua. Is a spirit? Could be. Not looked at it that way. We know that uh, most definitely his spirit was there, working mightily. It says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, out of the mouth the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall, not, which shall go before us. For uh, as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Interesting, the man that brought us up out of the e land of Egypt. Was it? God brought him out, didn't he? Jehovah. Yeah. <clears throat> it says, well, we don't know what has become of him. And all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hands and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Interesting. He fashioned it with a graving tool. But what did he what did he tell his brother, what did he tell Moses when he asked him, he said, what in the world, did you, what was you thinking? What was you doing? Well, I just throwed it all in the fire and out jumped this calf. It says here that he uh, used a graving tool and made a molten calf. Of course, <clears throat> a molten calf tells you that it was a poured metal. So to pour metal, you have to have a mold right so <clears throat> they would have to make a mold in the ground or out of some kind of a clay to pour this image of the of the calf yeah you would use that that graving tool to to cut the mold i don't know if y'all have ever done any of that kind of stuff when i was in high school that was one of the things that was taught in metal shop we had a small little little foundry and uh, you made a mold out of clay in a form. You would, uh, it was two-piece form, and you would, whatever that you were going to make an image of, if it was that, you'd put it in, in the between and pack the clay and, and then take it apart, take your deal out, and then put it back together and pour your metal in there. 
and uh, out would jump this this image, this cow. <laughs> so, so it's making golden calves, right? So that's that's how it works. You know, a lot of people, a lot of even scientists, whatever, says, well, this was impossible because they didn't have the technology to heat metal to that extreme to be able to pour it. That uh, <clears throat> that the foundry wasn't come into existence so many years later, the idea of using uh, oxygen to increase the temperature of, of the fire and so on and so forth. But <clears throat> we find that those people were a whole lot smarter than us. So we're going to move on. It says, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast of Yehovah. And he rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Interesting, I was looking in the Hebrew, this particular verse. And the word there for rose up has several meanings, but one of the meanings that really kind of stood out, jumped to me, was marriage. Actual meaning of that word used in Hebrew, one of the meanings was to marry. And so therefore, <clears throat> you know, we see later on how that they wanted to, they married other gods. They began to follow other gods and to celebrate their feast days and so on and so forth. So they basically made a covenant or a marriage contract with these other gods. And I thought, wow, it's pretty interesting because I'd always wondered what's the deal about sitting down to eat and to drink and to rise up to play. But it, it showed very much, I guess, like a reception after a wedding that you would uh, eat and drink together and then maybe dance or whatever, celebrating the event of marriage. So I thought, wow. And interesting, of course, the <clears throat> was that he built an altar and that uh, he declared the next day to be a feast to Jehovah. And that's always been kind of strange. I, I mean, this was a God that they were worshiping in Egypt why not just call him what he what it was? You know the name of the God. But he says, "No, this we're going <laughs> to celebrate this <clears throat> for Jehovah because this is Jehovah. This is the be the gods." So here's the question: Do we see the same thing happening in the world today, making gods of our own choosing and passing them off as Jehovah? everywhere the world says there are many paths to god is that true most definitely most definitely but it the uh, this was brought to to mind quite a bit to me the other night we went to uh, to see the shin young at noel wagner uh event center out there this is it's china chinese all put on by chinese people and uh, not really realizing what the, the the hidden agenda was i felt like it was a hidden agenda because they had uh, this thing was like a play but without monologue the monologue <clears throat> basically was a man and a woman come out and they would talk about what this next act would be. And then they would come out and reenact it with <clears throat> these beautiful dances that they were doing. The women had beautiful, you know, garments on. The men, were, it was all Chinese. Uh, beautiful dance, these types of things. But <clears throat> in two different places, three different places actually, 
they were showing the spiritual aspect. Supposedly, they thought, well, you know, that the uh, Chinese culture is at least 5,000 years old, and it's, it has a spiritual setting to it. And one of the things, I don't know if, I'm sure probably most people realize that martial arts is really a religion, okay? It's not just exercising the body or whatever. It is, has a deep spiritual meanings to it. So, <clears throat> and they make several statements in here. One that most all people that are on earth come from heaven. I'm going like, that's a pretty broad statement. And a couple of these acts that they were were showing the creator, but it wasn't the creator, Jehovah, that we know that created this world. So I'm just going to read this one thing to you. And each, each one of these things was, uh, had a different, like I say, like a part in a play. Acts, that's what it is. The name of this one is Lost in This World. Some may ask the purpose of our spiritual practice. It allows us to find our true selves and know why we are on this earth. Through it, our lives gain direction. Most all people came from heaven, heavenly realms. And it brought my mind, it says, most. Who didn't? Okay. To find the great way, capital letters, DAFA, D-A-F-A, and rescind in the final days, the Creator is here offering a path he strives to save lives from disaster. So often one gets lost in the world. Modern ways and values bring only ruin. The universe abides by truth, compassion, and tolerance. Our over lifetimes, one forgets the purpose here. The followers of Dafa bring awareness. Through them, you can find the way. You know, there's a lot of true statements within that. But then, who is this Dafa? Interesting. Pick it up sometimes. <clears throat> Go read Deuteronomy 32. And there's, you know, there's many, many others. One of the other things that they, one of the other acts was about Buddha. And uh, how did he save this young, young monk? <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, 15 to 18 says, But Yeshuram waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook Jehovah, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to Jehovah. To gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten Jehovah that formed thee. The world has instituted false feast days to replace Jehovah's and says, these be your gods. First Corinthians 10 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. 
and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat all the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was the Messiah. Interesting, when I was really looking at this, and, you know, he says, and I thought, well, how were they baptized by a cloud? If that cloud was the spirit of Jehovah, then they were baptized in the spirit and the water, and that's what he says to be, to truly enter into the kingdom of God, you have to be baptized with the water and the spirit. So, and he goes on and he says, to eat of that same spiritual meat. What is our daily meat? But Jehovah's word says we shall live not by bread, but by the, all the words that proceed from his mouth, right? So that's the Torah. That's all of the God's writings. And they had drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was the Messiah. says, but with many of them, Elohim was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be you idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. So they were our example. Unfortunately, many people are following the other example, right? Of what really was going on. It says, Neither let us tempt the Messiah, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all of these things happen to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are to come. Ends of the world. Interesting. There it's plural. Ends of the world. I think that there's been many ends of the eras and so forth. I mean, there was an end of the world in Noah's time. Right? How about maybe even an end of the world in Yahshua's time? Some 40 years after his death, the destruction, total destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. That could be called an end of the world, end of that era, end of their world. As you know, <clears throat> we're coming up to uh, Passover, and, and we know it's just a commemoration of the deeds that have taken place on that, and particularly the death of the Messiah. And <clears throat> to receive basically that redemption, you know, we must enter into that redemption. We can't just take it on face value and, and go on about our lives, but to actually enter into the redemption that that, Yah, <clears throat> that Yeshua has paid for us, paid for all of us through this whole system. So it's interesting, you know, that this uh, <clears throat> been pushed here lately about Lent. You know, it's been in the news, and a lot of people talk about what Lent is, 40 days later leading up to Easter Sunday and uh, they were to uh, to give up something for Lent uh, interesting very well fashioned after the very laws that Jehovah laid down that during uh, this Passover week that you take out the leaven he doesn't leave it to your discretion basically he says, take out the leaven out of your life. Whatever is leavening in your life, represented by the physical 
bread that has leaven in it being taken that leaven out because leaven makes it rise and puff up and to grow. And we allow that one little sin in our lives, it will grow and puff up and pretty soon it's out of control. It's interesting, uh, <clears throat> I run across this in the news. Y'all may have seen it. Be reconciled. Come to confession March the 21st. Visit a Catholic church near you. I thought it was kind of interesting. That being reconciled means confession to a priest. Yeah. When Jehovah wants to reconcile with us every day, he wants a confession to him. He took that intermarry out. He placed it there, the Yeshua himself being that intermarry, intermarry, intermarry. Yeah. Yep. Reconciliation. You know, this is one of the things we've been studying in our uh, VSC ministry is, you know, the different steps of forgiveness and that when you obtain forgiveness and we're talking about not only forgiveness from the Father but forgiveness from one another of the deeds and things that we've done to each other that uh, <clears throat> how that you can come into full reconciliation and to uh, to reestablish that that friendship that bond that covenant that uh, that we have or should have with one another and with Jehovah. So I thought it was kind of interesting. Come to confession. It's for those that have not been coming to confession. We're going to allow this to happen, and we're going to open our churches to this. says Roman 5 6 <clears throat> for when we were yet without strength in due time Yeshua died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die but Jehovah commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners Yeshua died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to Jehovah by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Two different things there, right? Reconciled, being saved. One leads the other, and you have to have both. Right. It says, not only, but we also joy in Jehovah through Yeshua, the Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. You know, we were talking of first in Exodus there about the money being as, as the atonement money. And we always think of, well, atonement's only, you know, on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. But in the earthly tabernacle, there was daily atonements being made. Actually, the morning and evening sacrifice was a daily atonement for the nation as a whole of Israel. Plus, you made your own personal atonements. They just didn't uh, rely upon those two atonements being made evening and morning in the sanctuary for their salvation. Basically, yeah. And without that redemption blood upon their doorpost, that death angel would have taken them along with it. Truly redemption truly being reconciled we're going to look at this thing a little bit more because we've talked about this before but i don't know if you fully grasp 
what is being said in these next verses and things. I hope that you get a better understanding of, of what really in actuality took place then is taking place now. It says, <clears throat> it says, they were reconciled by the death, but were saved by his life. Okay. How is his life saving us? Huh. A couple different places in Scripture, it talks about that there's only one man between us and Jehovah, and that's the man Yeshua. And we also look at this in Hebrews 9. But Yahshua being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with the hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Yeshua, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without a spot to Jehovah, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? That's part of it, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because, because Israel had basically divorced him and married other gods. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you, we can read that uh, that there was a bill of divorcement given to the ten tribes because of them whoring after other gods. And basically, wound up being scattered into Assyrian captivity and then scattered all over the world, basically. Like lost sheep. And that's why that when Yahshua came, he says, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Interesting. How that we've lost uh, or misinterpreted or we read over these little words and we go, but, you know, he come for all the lost, just us. Well, he did come for all of the lost, but mainly for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, he, and that's what he says, even though that your sister Judah has done as bad, if not worse. The, and that's, that's been kind of a hang-up for, for Judah, you know, today. Yet, Paul goes in and he tells you basically why. He says, because unto them was committed the oracles of God. We wouldn't have the knowledge in the scriptures that we have without them. Does that make everything they did right? No. They're going to have to answer for those things just like everybody else. Just like, yeah. Without it, though, there would be no preservation of his word. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Well, <clears throat> so that's, that's really where we are in the stream of time, is in the regathering of the lost sheep of the house of Israel back into Israel, right? And the conversion of Judah to her Messiah. Because in Jeremiah talks about, he, he told him, he says, take two sticks right up on one of them, Judah, and up on the other, Israel, or Ephraim for Israel. And he says, take them and put them together in your hand, and they will become one stick again, one nation again. And regardless of what being said by 
Judah today because they said, no, 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 no. That's, that's, that's already happened. Have we seen that really happen? No. It's, yeah. The, the, but the kingdom was never united under the king of, Ju, of the Judah after the division. And the division was, was brought about by disobedience and by whoring after other th- gods. And he told, <clears throat> he basically told Solomon that <clears throat> the kingdom will be divided, rent from your hands, but it won't be from yours, it will be from your son. And so we know what happened immediately after <clears throat> the separation of the, of the kingdoms, the ten tribes and the two tribes, the ten tribes being their king Jeroboam, and what did he do? He did the very same thing we read about in our today's Torah portion. He set up two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan, and extended the feast day from the seventh month until the eighth month. It says, these be your gods. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. These be your gods. Come here. Stay here. A lot of it's about money. A lot of it's about power because we see in the time of Yeshua they were trying to protect their authority and their money. So we're going to go on and read some more because there's some other things here I'd really like to see. You see. It said he became the high priest of good things to come. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, whom Jehovah has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in his blood, declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of Elohim, as we understand this point here, it becomes more and more clear what Paul was saying in Romans where he says that you are reconciled by his blood, but you'll be saved by his life. Paul was standing in a time when there was going to be a huge change, a huge shift. Paul didn't set out, basically, to even when he was called. Interesting, this is a little fact that's real interesting. Paul was <clears throat> born in the year of 5 AD, pretty close to that. Born in Taurus, a Cessalus, which that is way up in where Turkey is today. His mother and dad were Jew of Jew descent, but they were also Roman citizens. When he was about five years old, they moved the whole family to Jerusalem. And when he was about ten years old, he began to study the Torah under Gamaliel. Of course, we read in Acts where he was standing there at the stoning of Stephen. And when he left there, he was going to Damascus, and what happened? He was blinded, and he became a follower of Yeshua. Guess how old he was? 30 years old. Pretty interesting. Just like Yeshua, he was called to the ministry of, called to the priesthood. Because he said he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Interesting, I don't know if this is a true fact, and this is something that you probably need to look at. Some scholars say that <clears throat> Zadok, remember who's Zadok? They're a Levite, but they are, were the sect that was the more righteous ones instead of Eli. Supposedly, the Pharisees are a descendant of Zadok. 
that's something that you probably need to look up. And I thought it was kind of interesting. Meaning righteous, right? Actually, Zadok is, uh, what's the word? Uh, Zadik. Zadik, meaning righteous. Okay. All right, so we see here in Hebrews that his death was for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. And when you read in Hebrews where it talks about <clears throat> the first testament had its offerings of blood and all these type of things, the second testament is by better and greater things, Yeshua's own blood. So Paul was standing in the transition time between that testament and the new testament that was coming based on the same laws but different priesthood different operations of where that these things were going to take place no longer were they going to be taking place in the temple on earth but in the temple in heaven that's why he told him he says that there will not be one stone left upon another and 40 years later after his death that's what happened even after the death on the cross we can read in Josephus writings that for 40 years the doors to the temple automatically just opened on their own during the night that the menorah would not stay lit it would go out that the atonement cord that's tied on the doorpost never turned white we know in our in the New Testament shows that it is death the curtain was rent from top to bottom the curtain between the holy and the most holy and we know that during that period of time that there was the Ark of the Testament was not in the sanctuary so Paul was standing there so now when you get when you stand <clears throat> at that time and you stand in his shoes now you begin to understand some of the things that Paul says that that you can't wrap your mind around because he was raised and taught this and now Yeshua is saying this is the way it's going to be it's not a new religion we could actually call Paul a reformer because that was the whole idea was to show the laity shot not the laity but well the laity too but the, the leadership and that's what Messiah came to, his argument was with them, was not that, hey, you guys are, we're going to start a new church. No, the argument was, you've begun to follow the commandments of man instead of God. You've changed the ordinances. And he's basically calling for a reformation back to the original that, was, that he wanted to be done. So then when we, when we see these types of things here, his death does have a meaning for us, but not as much as it did for those who lived before because we have an ever-living intercessor that makes ever-living intercession for our sins. So when you read all these words that, you know, he made redemption forever. Then we read in Daniel 9:25. Of course, this is a whole prophecy that would take time to explain, but we're just going to look at some of the things where it says in, in relation to the sanctuary system. Says, know therefore, understand that from the going forth the command to restore, to build Jerusalem and to the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. He didn't die for himself because he was righteous. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that's what happened in 70 A.D. Right. And to the end of the war, desolation are determined, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall 
cause the sacrifice and the oblations to cease. So, here we are in this transition time between sacrifice and oblations being taken into the temple and done and to the idea that now that we have a greater high priest and more righteous high priest that never sinned, that had, has everlasting redemption. So you can understand what a turmoil that that brought. But it was because of disobedience and going away from following God. So instead of having this on earth, we have this with our high priest standing in the heavenly sanctuary. Because we have all these other verses that go with it. Know you not that you are the temple of Yahweh, and that the spirit of Elohim dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of Elohim, him shall Elohim destroy. For the temple of Elohim is holy, which temple you are. You know, just to think about this is scary. Are we defiling our temples? Spiritually, physically, mentally? Let's think about that. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of Jehovah, and you are not your own? For you are brought, bought with a price. Therefore, honor Elohim in your body. Remember the price of redemption that we talked about originally. He paid a higher price than gold and silver. It says, And what agreement hath the temple of Yahweh with idols? For ye are the temple of the living Elohim. As Elohim has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. That was the very same thing that he told Moses. He says, build me a tabernacle that I may dwell among you. So he's wanting to dwell among us. It says, wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate, saith Yahweh, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Now, the unclean things are a multitude of many things. For it says in First Peter, You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh by Yahshua the Messiah. Spiritual sacrifices. And the temple of Elohim was open in heaven, and there was seen in the temple of the sovereign the ark of his testament. That ark of the testament hadn't been seen on this earth in many, many, many years. But it's in the heavenly sanctuary. And there was lightning and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Where is the temple? Everybody nowadays is looking for a temple. Where, where, where is it going to be? Is it going to be built in, on top of the mount or down in the valley? Or, or is it going to be built? Uh, it's got to be built. We've got to have uh, sacrifices put back together. We've got to have uh, Yahshua's going to come in there and minister. And it's not what I see in the scriptures. It says you're the temple. It says let the mind of Yahshua be in you. He wants to dwell in your temple. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. 
And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of Elohim, who lived forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the worship of Elohim and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. This temple that they're building here on earth, what's for? All the judgments and everything are coming out of the temple in heaven. You can't read Revelation without seeing that everything that's going on in Revelation comes out of the temple in heaven. So whose temple are we going to be part of? Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for watching a teaching from Amet HaTorah. If you are ever in the Odessa area, we would love to welcome you to our Shabbat service, 11 a.m. every Sabbath. For more information or for more teachings, feel free to find us on the web, www.amethatoraodessa.com. Also, you can find us on Facebook. Thank you. God bless you and your family. Shalom.